Now, a thing worth doing is worth doing badly. At the beginning here, I want to take some refuge in my title. A thing worth doing is worth doing badly, including giving this talk, which might go very poorly. Uh, and likewise, a thing worth doing is worth doing badly, including growing a mustache. <laughs> Perhaps some of you may wonder whether growing a mustache is really a thing worth doing. But we may have irreconcilable philosophical differences on that one. <laughs> Robbie Bolton is also sporting the mustache today. Risk and failure. Risk and failure. Risking failing. <laughs> you too. You too can risk and fail at many things. All right. All right. A thing worth doing is worth doing badly. What does Chesterton mean by that? What in the world can he mean by that? Right? Surely, if a thing's worth doing, we want to do it well. We want to do a good job. We don't want to do shoddy work. So why not say that? And just repeat the common adage, a thing worth doing is worth doing well. How many of you have heard that before in your life? A thing worth doing is worth doing well. Yeah, half of us. Okay. Um, what does he mean? Is it anything more than just a witty rewording of the common phrase to make people laugh and go, ha, that was witty, and then go on? Right? Is there anything more to it than that? I think the answer is yes. And I hope to answer some of these questions. What does he mean by it? What's the background? What's the basic philosophical position he's operating from in which that kind of statement isn't just a one-off kind of witty one-liner? So to answer those questions, I've imagined a talk with three parts and three parts to each of those three parts. Uh, I read Bonaventure's Retracing the Arts to Theology last semester with some of you, and that's conditioned me to thinking in medieval threes. Um, so if that medieval reference doesn't do it for you, just think of Monty Python on the holy hand grenade, right? The number of our counting shall be three. That's what we will be doing. Our three sections are going to be, they're on the board, the premises, the professionals, and the amateurs. I put them up there so you can follow the wandering course of this lecture and console yourself with the fact that at some point it will end and you will get to go somewhere else. All right, so uh, the premises, the professionals, the amateur. Here we go. Uh, before we can begin to make sense of Chesterton's claim, we need to stop for a moment and examine the kind of creatures that we are and what kind of world it is that we live in. Before we can decide whether a thing worth doing is worth doing badly, we must first establish whether or not things are worth doing at all. And antecedent to that, we have to say what a thing is. What do we mean when we say a thing? We have to give some account, I suggest, of ontology, of the being of things. And so we need to begin with the robust doctrine of creation laid out by the scriptures the creeds and the fathers. Now we're all familiar with this. You all know this by heart. The Genesis creation account, we've all heard sermons about end on God's judgment of the creation he renders on the sixth day he saw that it was all very good. Right? You, you know that, you've, you've heard that over and over. So we're so familiar with that that I think the real implications of it don't strike us. We're just immune to it. So I'm gonna turn to two other passages, one from scripture and one from Chesterton that deal with the same theological statement but in fresh language that might rouse us um, to hear it for the first time, perhaps. First, from Wisdom 1124. Now, if that sounds strange to you, it's because it is. Wisdom's a deuterocanonical book recognized by the Catholics and the Orthodox, but not by the Protestants, so it's not in most of your Bibles, which is perfect for my purpose of letting you hear something fresh and for the first time, because you haven't heard it before, likely. Um, so you can hear with fresh ears the really radical fact of God's benediction on creation. So in the 11th chapter of Wisdom, the writer takes a brief digression from considering the symbolism of God's salvation of the is Israel and punishment of the Egyptians to praise God's power and his mercy. So addressing God and the greatness of his power, the writer claims that, quote, before you the whole universe is like a grain from a balance or a drop of morning dew come down upon the earth. Here are two beautiful similes, the whole of the cosmos, all the created order. All the unimaginable distances between the stars are like a small grain of weight in the balance of a scale or a droplet of water on the grass. Lovely images. And yet, despite the minuteness of the world, despite its tininess compared to the awesome existence and power of God, the writer goes on to claim that because of all that, God has mercy. Quote, and here it is, for you love all things that are and loathe nothing you have made. For you love all things that are and love nothing, loathe nothing that you have made. Insofar as a thing exists, it is beloved by God. Everything, all that is, swims in the plenitude of divine being. Being itself is the arena of God's approbation in this passage. It's being itself, existence itself, 
which God loves. Listen to Chesterton on the very same theme. Quote, there is at the back of all of our lives an abyss of light, more blinding and unfathomable than any abyss of darkness. And it is the abyss of actuality, of existence, of the fact that things truly are, and that we ourselves are incredibly, and sometimes almost incredulously, real. It is the fundamental fact of being as against not being. It is unthinkable, and yet we cannot unthink it. Though we may sometimes be unthinking about it, unthinking and especially unthinking. Being itself, the sheer fact of existence is a good beyond all telling. Indeed, even beyond our intellect's ability to conceive of it. All right, with that broad opening, now on to part two of point one, things, things. If that's our doctrine of creation, what do we mean by things? This point is easily put in the key of our original quote. Because things are, they are worth doing. Chesterton defends this basic premise in his first collection of essays, The Defendant, where in investigating the world and humanity, he finds that we're naturally disposed to praise pessimism as really revolutionary. When you're really sticking it to the man, when you're really being radical, you're being a pessimist. You're doubting the goodness of things. However, Chesterton thinks that's easy. Easy because, quote, pessimism, pessimism appeals to the weaker side of everybody. And the pessimist, therefore, drives as roaring a trade as the publican. In contrast, he argues that the optimist is the true revolutionary. Quote, the person who is really in revolt is the optimist, who generally lives and dies in a desperate and suicidal effort to persuade all the other people how good they are. It has been proved a hundred times over that if you really wish to enrage people and make them angry even unto death, the right way to do it is to tell them that they are all sons of God, end quote. <laughs> and Chester then points out that Christ was crucified not because of his claims about God, but is because of his claim that he could rebuild the temple in three days. The problem with this tendency of ours toward pessimism and cynicism, Chesterton argues, is that we're in constant danger of undervaluing the world, of forgetting the abyss of light which lies at the base of all our existences. And so he says we use the words good and bad indiscreetly. That's a bad knife, we say, of a knife which isn't cutting our steak like we would like it to. But not so fast, cries Chesterton. Insofar as the knife is a knife, it's good. It's just not as good as other knives we've gotten used to. Quote, a knife is never bad, except on such rare occasions as that in which it is neatly and scientifically planted in the middle of one's back. <laughs> the coarsest and bluntest knife, he goes on, which ever broke a pencil into pieces, is a good thing insofar as it is a knife. It would have appeared a miracle in the Stone Age. What we call a bad knife is a good knife, not good enough for us. What we call a bad hat is a good hat, not good enough for us. What we call bad cookery is good cookery, not good enough for us, he says. What we call a bad civilization is a good civilization, not good enough for us. This tendency leads us to disparage the everyday things of our experience, most especially our homes. And that's the idea that this talk is going to center around. But relying on the doctrine of creation, the goodness of being, because things are, they are worth doing, worth making, using, studying, and praising. Point three, imagination. In this world where the very being of things is the sight of God's love, where things are worth doing, we ought, Chesterton says, to have lives of rich imaginative symbolism and significance. Chesterton thought that a great possibility was lost at the French Revolution, which did away with the aristocracy and the tackle and trim of nobility and heraldry and the pop, pomp and circumstance associated with the great ones of the world. But while he applauded the revolution for its goal of equality, he laments that the revolutionists took the negative route. Instead of telling the peasant that he was as good as the Duke of Norfolk, they told the peasant, the Duke of Norfolk is no better than you. See the difference there? It's bringing everybody down instead of raising everybody up. This is a great blunder, he claims. Quote, for the, all the pride and vivacity of heraldry, all the pageants and flaming colors and symbols and festivals should have been extended to mankind. The tobacconist should have had a crest and the cheesemonger a war cry. Quote. And so, he argues, we ought to view our homes, our work, our neighborhoods with the same imaginative and symbolic eye with which the king views his castle. And we ought to speak of such things as the poet speaks of the heroes. He says in the Colored Lands that it's, quote, the main earthly business of a man to make his home 
and the immediate surroundings of his home as symbolic and significant to his imagination as possible. Okay, there's the first part, part one done. Things, creation, things, and imagination. That's the basic understanding from which he's going to advance this argument about the amateur. So, the professionals. With all this theology we've just done as a foundation, Chester makes this claim, if things worth doing, it's worth doing badly. Why make that claim? Given all the theology we've just laid out, it makes just as much sense to say if things worth doing, it's worth doing well. So why argue for space to do things poorly? He's insisted on this point because already in the first decade of the 20th century, he makes this claim of things we're doing it's worth doing badly and what's wrong with the world, which comes out in 1908, the first decade of the 20th century. And already then, Chesterton was afraid of the rise of the expert, afraid that in a world of increasing technical mastery, we might begin to delegate much of our lives to the professionals. And less than this, less this slogan of his seemed merely a, a funny kind of joke to justify people who aren't good at things. Let's be clear, there's real danger with regard to our privileging of the specialist. Romano, Romano Guardini, the German theologian, philosopher, and social critic, who if you don't know, you really ought to read. He's quite good and fairly short. Has pointed out in his perceptive, incisive survey of modernity, the end of the modern world, that at the heart of the modern project is increasing control of the natural world. One of the things that defines modernity is our increasing ability to control the natural world and our environment. If you doubt that, just look at our abilities to manipulate genes, or your ability to FaceTime with friends who are 4,000 miles away, or our ability to kill people with the push of a button and a drone. In this world of increasing technical mastery, it's the expert, the one who knows the specialized systems, who becomes the privileged member of society, and we have great faith in our technocrats. However, Guardini highlights the modern assumption that increasing power is synonymous with increasing progress. It's what we just assume. That our ability to control our environment to an ever de greater degree is de facto good for human flourishing. That's going to be good for us. The more control we have, the better it's going to be for us. Quite the opposite, Guardini argues, power can be used for good or ill. And quote, recent years have been marked by a monstrous, monstrous growth in man's power over being, over things, and over men. But the grave responsibility, the clear consciousness, the strong character needed for exercising this power have not kept pace with its growth at all. Our ability to manipulate our environment has outstripped our ability to direct and control that manipulation. And instead, we assume that increasing mastery is just inevitable and inevitably good. Uh, you don't, we don't ask whether our phones are going to get faster. Right? You just assume that they're going to. That's just going to happen. That's inevitable. Likewise, you don't ask whether it's a good thing for our phones to get faster. That's just going to happen, right? Of course it is. And anyway, it's inevitable. So why bother about it? Simply put, in Guardini's terms, we don't have power over our power. But in such a state of affairs, the expert has become the one in control, the one in charge, the one driving the research, the growth, the increasing technical mastery. And so we live in the area of the specialist, and we resign many of the basic features of our lives to professionals. Let's start with art, where this is maybe the most obvious. Maybe. Look at your life and the discretionary time you spend in entertainment. We'll call art entertainment. We'll use them synonymously. We sit in theaters with beautiful people on beautiful screens, speaking beautiful words. We watch impeccably muscled athletes make superhuman catches. We all did it a week and a half ago. We listen to musicians who might rival Orpheus himself sing in perfectly modulated studios with skilled producers to mix the sound just right. That's what we do with our recreational time. But what are we recreating? This is our re recreation time. What is it we're recreating? We're consuming a lot, but we're not creating very much. Now, let me say, I, I am not trying. The point of this is to not berate ourselves for going to see Rogue One on Saturday and watching the game on Sunday and listening to our iPods every other day of the week. That's not the point. The point is not to disparage those things. Nor is this a complaint against art with a capital A, right? The kind of art done by skilled professionals who've dedicated their lives to it. 
That's not what we're saying either. We want beautiful art done by professionals who've dedicated their lives to it. We all want that. But more than that, and underlying that professional work, like the bulk of an iceberg lies underneath the water and you just see the tip. More than beautiful art done by professionals, we want mediocre music and mediocre theater and mediocre sports done by amateurs. That's by you and me. Now that probably sounds insulting. If I said, hey, would you like to listen to some mediocre music? You'd say, no, of course not. But remember Chesterton's point about the knife. Mediocre music is only good music. That's not good enough for us. And our displeasure with mediocre music, what we might call mediocre music, stems from our incessant exposure to music produced and mixed to achieve an almost unachievable perfection. Can you sound like what you hear on your iPod? No, of course you can't, because that person can't sound like that either, right? Until they've been in a studio for 10 hours with people paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to mix the sound just right. Okay. We get this point about body image. If I put it in that context, you get what I'm saying, right? We are increasingly aware of the problems caused by constant exposure to unrealistic body types. That does damage to us. It gives us unrealistic expectations for what we ought to look like. Because those people don't actually look like that. I suggest we're at a similar risk with regard to our sports, our music, our art, and our drama. It doesn't say that all those things we do, the blockbusters and the NFL and iTunes are bad. I'm not saying that at all. But maybe that ought to be the tip of the iceberg and not almost the entire content of the way we experience and participate in art. We're in peril of unrealistic expectations which cause us to dislike our own attempts in these arenas or likely not to attempt anything at all. When's the last time you got up and sang in front of a large group of people? Some of you do it, but most of us don't, right? Or are you even sang just in a large group of people? Well, at church, I suppose we do that. That's a space in which we're comfortable doing that, generally. But culturally, that's largely disappeared. All right, so there's the professional art. Let's talk about education for a second. I mean, what are we all doing here? We cede the basic task of education to the professionals. We generally regard the education of children as the responsibility of either the state or whatever private school we tend to send them to. And that's not meant to disparage teachers. That's not my point here. Yet, in our educational arrangements, we tend to view the schools as doing the primary work and the parents as the helpers, maybe with the homework in the evening or something. But they're auxiliary, they're secondary, rather than the other way around. And this is true of our own educations as well. The contractual, consumptive model that governs our culture tends to influence our understanding of what we're doing with our educations. So as you sit here, you think, maybe you don't think. This is the dominant cultural model, though, and some of you think it. I've paid Spring Arbor for my degree. I paid them for this class. It's Spring Arbor's responsibility and the professor's responsibility, whoever that might be, to provide that service. As paying customers, we've got the right to do what we want while that service is being delivered. If I've paid somebody for a hamburger, they don't get to complain if I'm on my phone while they give me that hamburger. Right? If I've paid a professor for a class, they don't get to complain if I'm on my phone while they deliver me whatever I've paid them to do. And if you think that sounds just incredible, I've, I've had students make that argument in class. We've talked about phones in class. It's the role of a phone in a class. People have made that very same argument. It's just, it's in the water that we drink. All right, okay. How about politics? The professionals in politics. That we've given our politics over to the experts is obvious simply from our language, where professional politician has become a damning sort of term, right? You really want to cut somebody in Washington. He's like, oh, they're just a professional politician. Ugh. Horrendous. Horrible. The phrase confesses our dislike of the fact that our political representatives have made a career of their service in Washington. Yet our general solution to this problem seems to be find other different new politicians to go make a career of service in Washington. The focus remains on what's happening there in DC. Regardless of whatever the experts decide they're to do, whatever side they might be, whoever they are, doesn't matter. The focus is there. The nation, the polis, are somewhere else besides our own homes, our own fields, and our own towns. So when we pledge our allegiance to the flag and to the republic for which it stands, we aren't often thinking of the republic, the race publica, 
in Latin, the common thing, the thing we all share in common and possess together. We don't have that in mind. We, usually, we certainly don't have in mind, as you stand there pledging the allegiance, you don't have in mind the two large playgrounds here in Spring Arbor or Lime Lake. Even though those are, to my mind, some of the obvious common things that we share here in our community. Things which shape our little commonwealth here, along with the university, the elementary school, the Free Methodist Church, Hutches. To even suggest to you that as you sing the national anthem or as you watch it on TV, you might be a think thinking especially of Hutches, right? Or Gallagher Fields over there. That's preposterous. We laugh at that. That's silly. Why is that silly to us? What's strange about that? These are central things of our community. Because they're small? Because Spring Arbor's small? We'll deal with that when we get to the, the amateur and the professional. But that wouldn't have seemed preposterous. It seems preposterous to us. It seems silly to say. It would not have seemed so to our ancestors, to our human ancestors. You remember Lord Mockley's lines of Horatius Cockley's at the bridge, ready to defend Rome against the overwhelming odds, the invading army. How can a man die better than facing fearful odds for the ashes of his fathers and the temples of his gods? It's great lines. The ashes of the temples were just behind Horatius as he stood on the bridge, ready to defend it. In his home, in Rome, the dearest thing he knew. If Horatius were here in Spring Arbor, defending us against the invading hordes of Hisda Hillsdale, right? It would be the Free Methodist Church and Hutches that he's thinking of. Defending. But we don't think like that anymore. That's the, the nation is somewhere else. It's not right here. OK. There's the professionals. Now we're finally ready. Having done all that, hey, we can get to the thing this is actually about, being amateurs. So establishing his premises and exploring the dangers of excessive reliance on professionals, I want to advance the hero of this talk, the amateur. That's you and me. Especially you. I'm a professor after all, so like professionals half in my name. Um, you're the real amateurs, which is great. We ought to pause a moment. This is why it's great, because we need to pause a moment over that word and think about it, amateur. That signifies to us, at the first level, probably someone who's either new to a task or not good at it. In video game parlance, that's a newbie, right? That's what we mean by amateur. Somebody who's just started something and doesn't know what they're doing. Or maybe has tried for a while and is still just really terrible at it. And if we thought a minute more about amateur, maybe we come to something like somebody who's not paid for their work. An amateur baseball player, for instance, as opposed to professional. Right? There's, there's a context of amateur we might no. Uh, those aren't wrong, but the truth of the word, the real weight of the word, goes even deeper than that. If you have your Latin, you'll recognize the root of the word from the conjugation, that good old verb, amo, amare, amawi, amatus. To love. To love. The amateur is a lover. That's what it means to be an amateur. To be a lover. One who does what she does, not because she's paid, or not with a view towards reward, but simply because she loves it. What's the best motivation for doing something? When we want some trivial task done, right? Some everyday sort of thing like building a bridge or going to the moon. Get a professional for that. But when you want to do the really important things, the really terribly, awfully important things, like raising children or founding a nation, only a lover will do. A lover who loves his children or his home or his country, not because it's good to him, not because it's going to advance his cause in the world, not because he's going to get something out of it, but simply because it's been given into his care. And to it he owes an elementary allegiance. The really important things in life must be left to the amateurs. Chesterton develops this point, especially with regard to politics, in Orthodoxy, one of his most celebrated works, where he says that the most important human things are the things we all hold in common together. And politics, he argues, is one of those things. Quote, the democratic, the democratic contention is that government, which he is helping to rule the tribe, he says. The democratic contention is that government is a thing like falling in love. It is not something analogous to playing the church organ. 
It is not something analogous to painting on vellum or discovering the North Pole or looping the loop or being the royal astronomer and so on. For those things, he says, we do not wish a man to do it all unless he does them well. Government, on the other hand, is a thing analogous to writing one's own love letters or blowing one's own nose. These things we want a man to do for himself, even if he does them badly. In short, the democratic faith is this. Chesterton says, quote, the most terribly important things must be left to ordinary men themselves. The mating of the sexes, the rearing of the young, the laws of the state, end quote. When it comes to choosing a partner in marrying, we certainly don't want to be professional lovers. Right? That has a quite different context and meaning. And we recognize that love is not a business, and the people who, view, who treat love as a business are not particularly people we want to emulate, right? For whatever reason, that they might be treating it like that. We don't want to be professional lovers. We, we've, we've, got, we've retained that. You know that. Similarly, the idea of being a professional parent is repugnant. It must be a professional parent. That's against the very essence of parenthood. It misses something of the essence of what it means to be a parent, which is to be responsible for a life of another in a bond you can ignore, but you can't ever really break or sever. Your kids are your kids, and they just are. You can't escape that. You can ignore it, but you can't escape it. The, con the contractual model simply fails to touch parenting altogether. Right? So we don't want to be a professional parent. We don't want to be a professional lover. But in each case, that of the lover and that of being the parent, being an amateur necessarily means risk and failure. Guaranteed. It means not having all the answers Taylor made. It means having to do something for the first time without knowing what the results will be. It means failing your spouse and your children, as every spouse and parent in this room knows. Just guaranteed. Built into the, built into the exercise is a whole lot of failure. Yet the other option, that of being the professional lover, the professional parent, is so clearly hideous that the choice is very clear. That's easy for us. We see that. If marrying and parenting are worth doing, they're worth doing badly. They're worth being amateurs at. They're worth not having all the answers figured out, but jumping into it anyway. So with that in mind, that's one we can see, I think, fairly easily, I hope. Let's consider the amateur in politics and the amateur in art. All right, the amateur in politics. The lover in politics must begin with his own home. Aristotle observed a long time ago that the family and the household are the basic building blocks of society, the first principle upon which the rest of the polis is going to be built. So we must begin with our own places, our own little households and our own little polis, even when they seem small and limited and doomed to being done badly, like Spring Arbor is small and limited and a tiny little town somewhere in the middle of Michigan. One of the best examples I know of this occurs in book four of the Odyssey. When Menelaus offers young Telemachus, Telemachus three stallions to take back to Ithaca. Telemachus has been visiting, traveling around, listening for news of his dad. Right? All those of you who are in here who've read the Odyssey with me know just how this goes. And Menelaus is hosting him and giving him, he's going to send him off and give him all this stuff. And he gives him a pot and all kinds of things. He gives him three stallions. And Telemachus refuses the gift, cautiously. Cautiously refuses it. Because when rich people want to give you stuff, you've got to be careful about how you say no. Right? He refuses, pointing out Ithaca's rocky nature. Menelaus, after all, he says, you live in wide, rolling Sparta. Big, broad plains. It's great for stallions. But, but he simultaneously, Telemachus does, praises his home for the very rockiness, which makes it unsuitable for the horses. It's goat land, not stallion land, he tells the king. Quote, none of the rocky islands sloping down to the sea are good for bridal paths, but Ithaca, best of all islands, crowns them all. Now, in any sort of abstract plane of comparison, if you have to choose goats or stallions, which do you choose? Stallions, yes, way cooler than goats. Way, way cooler than goats. But Telemachus isn't an abstract disembodied judge who gets to weigh things out like that. But he's rather enfleshed and enmeshed in a particular time and place. And for Telemachus, Ithaca is both the goatiest of the goat lands, but also the best place in the world. Indeed, in the passage, the, the, the glory of Ithaca 
None of the islands are good for battle. They're all rocky, but Ithaca, best of all, and its crowns, it's simultaneously the most goat-like, and that's, its, that's what gives it its glory. That's why he loves it. Here I suggest is an enriching vision of home, which doesn't ignore the limitations of our homes, the ways they might be done badly, but rather embraces these limitations as constitutive of identity. In his introduction to the Aeneid, Bernard Knox finds the same sentiment at work when he contrasts the imperial Rome, the Italy, sorry, of imperial Rome and of Mussolini, who loved Italy because it was great and powerful, having made the Mediterranean our sea, as they called it. He contrasts that with the Italy of Aeneas and Dante, the, quote, low-line Italy, which describes Aeneas' first sight of his new homeland. And Dante returns to it as an image of his Italy. The same diminutive and limited note occurs here as in Telemachus' praise of Ithaca. Politics begins with love of our homes and our willingness to do all things however wild in praise of them, to quote Innocent Smith. It begins from our love of our places, not being particularly good at caring for them, but loving them. Not being paid to love them, not having official positions in the government, simply being lovers of the places we live. Okay, finally, we're approaching the end. It's almost over. <laughs> finally, the arts. Uh, let's start to talk about the, start with the word poesis. Poesis. You guys, although you've taken 104, which is probably all of you, right, and read Marilyn Chandler McIntyre's book, Caring for Words in a Culture of Lies, you remember, I'm sure, I'm sure you remember, her discussion of poesis, of making. It's, it's the word that we get poetry from. And she uses the word to advocate poetic making as a way of caring for words, which is quite good. Um, but the range of poesis includes all of human making, not just the love poems you write, but all the things you make, whatever it might be. Everything which combines form and matter to achieve some end. That's making. It's human making. I want to, I want to think about this because I think this might be the key. If, you want to, if you're like, well, that wasn't all half bad. Maybe there were some good things about that. Maybe I do want to be an amateur. Hmm, perhaps. Here's where you start, I think. This is the place where you begin. Because if we can be in you see, our homes and our entertainment, our play as a place of productive making, then seeing our homes as the centers of education and political life is not going to seem so strange. If we're willing to recognize that things worth doing, or worth doing badly, we'll begin to recognize the poetic potential that's all around us, just waiting to be transformed into actual entertainment, merriment, and delight. And the best image for this, I think, in Chesterton's work is his novel, Man Alive, which will, offers a wonderful meditation on this theme. The novel concerns the boarders at a boarding house in London who are themselves rather bored with life. Nothing much happens. They don't do much of anything. Into their midst vaults the fantastic and enigmatic figure of Innocent Smith, who turns their stayed life upside down by turning himself literally upside down around them, inside the house and inside their lives, and inviting the residents to join him in viewing life from such a refreshing perspective. So in the space of a day, he takes all the various little hobbies they've been doing and transforms them into formal events. So Arthur Inglewood's occasional photographs are transformed into a small gallery. Then a Duke's economical dressmaking becomes Smith's lightning dressmaking company, where he draws fantastic pictures on black dresses with chalk, and then wipes them all off and draws another picture. So she can wear something for dinner and something else for dessert. Rosamund Hunt's songs become an opera. Michael Moon's occasional paragraphs become a magazine. In each case, Smith gives form, shape, definition to what other characters are already doing privately and timidly. This form giving is not to be overlooked. You can't just play for long. If I say go play, you can't, and you just try to play in the abstract, you can't do that for very long. right? You need a form. You need something you're going to do. What am I going to play? Am I going to play a video game, a board game? Am I going to play my guitar? Am I going to read a play? Right? You have to do something. That has to be enfleshed and particularized somehow. 
So if we're gonna practice our paralysis, our making, then the making must have some formal shape, and the more defined, specific, and limited, the better. And in that light, as an example, the kind of thing I'm talking about, the Salon de Refuse, put on by One South, right? And Andrews, that's, man, that's fantastic. That's like, that is the prime example of exactly what I'm talking about. That kind of amateur form giving. Hey, we're sitting around. We've got time to do. What should we do? I don't know. I'm imagining. I have no idea how you all started that. I'm just imagining. Right? Let's have an art show. Let's dress up. Good. Excellent. And you make a big deal out of it. That's the kind of form giving. That's kind of play. That's kind of regarding our lives. Not the things we watch on the screens. Those are fine. But our lives and the stuff right around us as fertile ground for having quite good fun. And form giving ought also to help us pay attention to our surroundings. Though he's only at Beacon House for a short time, Innocent Smith discovers all kinds of things that the other residents have overlooked because he's looking for opportunities to exercise his form giving play. That is, he's looking for things worth doing badly. For instance, he has this idea of home rule at home for Beacon House. He suggests the boarding house is gonna, is gonna uh, separate from England and be their own tiny little independent nation just on the house there, in the house there. A totally independent state. And he discovers on the premises all the necessary things for a coronation if they decide they want to be a monarchy. He finds oil and crown and even a canopy. And as he tells the incredulous residents when they say, no, those things can't be here, he says, I bet you've never examined the premises. I bet you haven't really looked at where you live. I bet you've never been around back as I was this morning, for I found the very thing you say isn't there. There's only a sort of square tent up against the dustbin. It's got three holes in the canvas and a pole's broken. It's not much good as a tent, but as a canopy for a coronation. And his voice quite failed him to express its shining adequacy. In his quest to make Beacon House a place of productive play, Smith knows details about the place which Moon couldn't dream of knowing even though he's lived there for five years. Nor is this some fairy power unique to Smith. It comes he claims simply from the nature of the world, from the fundamental doctrine of creation with which we first began. He defends this point vociferously when the other residents of the palace accuse him of playing at fairy tales, like the Swiss family Robinson. That's all nice to view around this way, they say, but that's just, that's fiction. Don't say a word against the Swiss family Robinson, cried Innocent with a great warmth. It mayn't be exact science, but it's dead accurate philosophy. When you're shipwrecked, you really do find what you want. When you're really on a desert island, you never find it a desert. If we were really besieged in this garden, Smith continues, we'd find a hundred English birds and a hundred and English berries that we never knew were here. If we were snowed up in this room, we'd be the better for reading scores of books in that bookcase that we don't even know are there. We'd have talks with each other, good, terrible talks, that we should go to the grave without ever guessing. We'd find materials for everything, christening, marriage, funeral, yes, even a coronation. Here Smith is championing the poetry of limitation a poetry which he's able to read and practice because he's engaged in form-making play that takes his local environment as the proper site for seriously applying himself to merriment. Because he's willing to play with his home, Smith can quite easily imagine it as the literal center of culture and political life. He's willing to play with it and so he can imagine it as its own little state all by itself. Perhaps this is the place where we can begin, as I suggested, to practice being amateurs, who are willing to attempt worthy things, even if it means doing them badly. Maybe if we can learn to play in our homes, if we can begin to love them with our imaginations as amateurs, maybe then we can be re begin to reclaim other human things, such as education and politics, for ourselves, our families, and our neighborhoods. Maybe we can begin to recognize that things worth doing, or worth doing badly. Thank you. We've got a couple minutes if there are any questions. So Mark. I'll take a stab then. Yeah. So it seems that facing the internet idea or mm. theory mm -hmm. is that one state will produce what it can do most efficiently and stop producing what it can do inefficiently to maximize
compromise trade with another state then that can produce the thing that it can't produce, so that then they can have more of all of these things at a cheaper level. So it seems like then in our own life to embrace amateurism would be to try to do all things well, to sort of see the self as the whole, rather than to say there are certain things I do extraordinarily well. Mm -hmm. I will put all of my efforts into that so that yeah. we can maximize our social or society-wide production of the good. Yeah. Is that a fair? Is that a fair reading? That is, is amateurism giving up on efficiency and production? Ah, uh, yeah. I think probably, I think the first thing Chester would say would be yes. Good. Who wants to be efficient? Not us. It's not a particular virtue, efficiency. I think it's the first thing he would say. Um, I think he would say, at one level, the, at one level, the specialist is important and necessary. Right? I mean, that's what I do for a living. I'm a, I'm a professor. It's in my title, for crying out loud. So it's not to say that there ought, we, oughtn't be spe we oughtn't be good at particular things. Of course we should be. We need good bridge builders, right? We need good stonemasons. We need good whatever it is you want to be doing. Good, we need good ones of those. Um, the problem is twofold, I think he would say. One, we become myopic. And we think of ourselves only as the thing we can do the best. And so we forget, he says, that in addition to being a first-rate plumber, a man is also a fourth-rate bagpiper and a fifth-rate dancer, right? We forget all these other parts. We become, we become merely a piece of the machine. Here's our machine. We've got to produce something. OK, part, you do x. We reduce. It's a, it's a reductionist view, I think you would say, at one level. Um, and two, there are some things, some really important things, that we don't want specialists to do. That even if someone else can raise my children better than I can, can raise them more efficiently, if some community or some state has the market on child raising, that that's not, I'm not going to send my children there, right? That, that's, that there are some things that are um, more fundamental. He would probably say more fundamental. We might say more sacred. I don't know. Um, where that model doesn't work. I, I would guess that would be his answer. Something like. But probably much wittier. <laughs> Good. Anybody else? All right. Go enjoy chapel. Go enjoy chapel in Peter Inns.